Hey everyone, Mitchell here. Before we get started, we want to say a big thank you to the Walton Family Foundation for their support this season. Hey Mitchell, are you ready for some ranch talk? Tara, uh, you know, it's been great getting you on the show and bringing all these new ideas and stuff, but this is a farm show, not a ranch show. Not today. Today it's a ranch show. But Tara, the name of the show is Field Work about like farms and fields and stuff not about like it's not a chewing cud wandering around in the prairie for no good reason show <laughs> Mitchell you really have to broaden your horizons well everyone welcome to field work I'm Mitchell Hora and I'm a farmer from Iowa I'm Tara Vanderdeusen I'm a dairy farmer in New Mexico and today on the show I guess we're gonna mix things up we're gonna talk about ranching I don't know a whole lot about ranching but we're gonna find out here today Tara, what are we going to be talking about here? Yeah, so our guest is Ryan Bruski. He's a rancher from eastern Montana. He and his father, Joe Bruski, have cows, goats, pigs, and hens at their place. Ryan, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to it. Ryan, so let's get started by sharing a little bit about your ranch. Could you share where you're located? You know, how many acres? What do you have going on there? You bet. Um, we're in southeastern Montana, down in Ekalaka town of about 300 and that's the county seat and uh it's a nice little community we we sure enjoy living where we do we get about 12 inches of precip a year and um we live on very sandy soils we uh run cows on right at 12,000 acres and we have this this year we're calving out 550 cow calf pairs and then we have that many yearlings grazing ahead of them and yeah sounds like a lot of stuff going on on the ranch tell us a little bit more about it and uh, tell us about how's life out in montana it's much better this year than last year we've been catching some very nice moisture this year and uh last year we went through one of the worst droughts and I think a hundred years or something like that. It was a it was a bad one. So doing doing really well this year. That's that's good to hear. Things have been sitting pretty good at our place in southeast Iowa as well. So good. good. That's awesome. Um so the ranch sounds like a lot of different a lot of different livestock, a lot of different stuff going on, not just a cattle ranch. Right. Yeah, we're kinda we're the out of the box thinkers compared to most people in our area, I guess. We kind of have uh eggs and all sorts of different baskets scattered out on the place and uh i guess i kind of learned that from gabe and paul brown when i went to college i worked for him for a couple of years just after class and on weekends and he made me change the way i saw things instead of just how we did things he made me change the way i was looking at things and uh yeah definitely opened my mind up to there's a better way and instead of fighting nature to maybe try to work with nature. So we've been trying to do that and uh, it hasn't been an easy, easy deal to do, but we've been uh, enjoying the transition into regenerative agriculture. And, and we had Gabe Brown actually in a previous episode on the Fieldwork podcast. He's the author of Dirt to Soil, One Farmer's Journey into Regenerative Agriculture. So just a little background on, on Gabe. How did you meet Gabe and you know, start learning about regenerative ag from him. He was well down the path, like you say. They were still making some really big changes around there when I was working for him. He started to, oh, his son was uh, the range science teacher at uh, BSC when I was going to college over there. He's the one that got me hooked on a job. He was just looking for a labor, and I went out there, and I learned I'd have to say I learned more there than I did at three years of school. But um, yeah, he he was an open book. It was sure fun to go work for him because not only just to go learn how they were doing things, just to see how they were doing things was huge for me. Yeah, that visual of being able to actually hands on. I feel like that's the way college always goes. College teaches you lots of like, you know, great information, great theories, like great ideas, sparks your interest. But then when you got to get out there and like get your hands dirty and see like what it actually is like and what works on the ground versus what works in, you know, a classroom or a textbook. Exactly. Yeah, it 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 really did. It was like I was only four hours from home and before it was, you know, that's kind of what a farmer and rancher's favorite saying is, is, oh, I can't do that at my place. And so I was only four hours from home and I was like, 
I know they have way nicer topsoil and they do get more rain over here, but why can't I try this? I mean, every, all the principles are the same, no matter where you're at. And I, I didn't know that then, but I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to do this in a drier environment. I wanted to be, I wanted to do it, you know? So, and I want, and we needed to change for me to be happy on our own place. So, I mean, it, we had to change to keep things going. So how long have you been working on that transition? The first year I worked for Gabe was in 2012 and we started to, I started to implement some of the pasture rotations and bringing hogs to the place that summer. So it's, we're coming up on 10 years now and the, even last year through the drought, it felt like we had a handle on things compared to what it was in previous years. So I have a question for you um, about coming back to the farm. So you obviously went away to school, learned a lot from Gabe, working with Gabe. What was it like coming back to the farm and being like, hey, dad, I want to change everything. Like, I've got all these ideas. Like, what do you think uh, about them? Like, was he open or? No, I mean, change is hard for every, anybody, right? I mean, it's it's hard to say that what we've been doing for the last 30 years is wrong or whether it's wrong or not change is hard you know so no that was kind of uh I mean I had piles of kids in my class that they were like well I'd like to do it but my dad says it won't work here right because that's just what most dads will say when you come home but I didn't really care I just went and I bought a couple poly wire reels and went and started moving the cows on my own and kind of I introduced my dad to Gabe and that was a big, it wasn't just coming from his kid that way, you know, and that helped a bunch and Gabe was able to kind of get on the same level with him and that helped a lot, but it was just kind of the first couple of years were getting him to see the changes, you know, like I just go bail graze, go take out some really old hay, scatter them on a hill the next year, the yield would be way better when we'd go across that where before it'd be absolutely hardly nothing, you know? So just a lot of visual was okay, but I, I kind of just did it and it was like a beg for forgiveness instead of ask permission type of a deal. So we, uh, but like you say, it wasn't an easy, easy process at all. It, we just started calving late in May in 2018. So, I mean, it took a few years to, get the ball rolling on the whole change. But um, the grazing thing was the first thing that we were, ha he was happy with seeing the change. And we, that kind of got the ball rolling on him having an open mind to try and all this stuff. So I want to get more into the grazing, but I want to ask one follow up. So how does he feel now? Like with all of the changes and. I mean, if you ask him and ask it, any of our neighbors will ask what we're doing, you know, out there, he'll say, I won't go back. He, he does love the, love the lifestyle change. I mean, before it seemed like we're always busy, any rancher or farmer is, you know, but we at least now we make time for family and to enjoy some of the little things. And, uh, yeah, he, he, he says he wouldn't go back. He, he does question what we're doing once in a while, but he's still open for it. I mean, we're, it's a lot to be thrown at from going from raising 700 pound calves in the fall to 450 to 500 pound calves in the fall and having big yields you could brag about at the coffee shop, but that was making us less money than these little calves are. So the main kind of stuff that you guys first started like seeing changes on was was what? Like, what was some of those validations? Because it sounded like at the beginning, you're doing some like rotational mob grazing, the bale grazing stuff, uh, which you'll have to explain bale grazing to uh, to everyone here too. So kind of explain bale grazing, explain like what, what were those like key initial indicators that you guys were watching for that were the validations that you really needed to push on? Um, Just our stocking rate and our kind of our drought tolerance. You know, we were we were knocking a lot of litter over, so we were covering up our soil that a lot of it had been bare. And so we're in like a 12 inch rainfall environment and or that's precipitation throughout the year with snowfall. So we're, we're fairly dry and arid. And uh, so every little bit of moisture we can get and keep in the soil is a win. And before we were probably evaporating half of those 12 inches, I mean, just cause it was falling on bare ground. 
So by the bale grazing, that just kind of re jump started some of our sand hills that were, I mean, you might, you could put down as much fertilizer as you'd want and you'd get a five bushel wheat crop on it. And I mean, that's on a, on a good year. So by bale grazing those, we increased our water holding capacity. And I remember the first year that I'd done it, it was up on a hill and I, we fed cows there all winter. So, um, it, it worked out really well for covering a bunch of country with them but uh the combine monitor we were combining barley and we were had a good year we were combining 60 bushel barley and when we got to the bell grazing spot before it would have maybe yielded 15 to 10 bushel barley and we got to that where it bell grazed and it went up to 90 95 bushels so that was kind of a a light bulb kick on for dad and me it was like wow this is we we can do something with this you know so that was one of the indicators with bale grazing and the just the grazing just you know moving them moving them more often instead of just moving them every week or turning out in a pasture for continuous grazing in the summer um we just saw how much more drought tolerant we were can you share a little bit more, um, I know Mitchell mentioned this, but like about the different types of grazing and what you changed from, like what were you originally, what did you move to? Like just get into a little bit more detail about that. You bet. We did have a, I mean, somewhat of a past rotation, but it wasn't It wasn't the science that it is now. And it, it uh, there's still plenty of overgrazing and underresting going on in our pastures. We we did have, we'd kind of gotten real away from all continuous season grazing. We had grouped up our cows even before that and um, weren't really continuous grazing anything, but it just was maybe, you know, we were moving, we'd be in a pasture for three to four weeks and just small, just had more groups where now during the winter time, we are on daily or two day moves in all through the winter. And that's really helped our production as far as it's getting even manure distribution throughout the field instead of them just dropping all their manure around the wind breaks and the water tank. Um, I learned that from Cooper Hibbard up in uh, Sabean Livestock. He, he was one that He's, he showed some of his data from moving daily versus moving every week. And it was just a light bulb for me to say, man, I want to do that. And so we, that's, that's been the big one is our winter grazing, moving daily and moving every, you know, and it's, I like the word adaptive grazing because if we want to go see my family in North Dakota or wherever, you know, we're, we're gone for a week the cows are in a week long pasture. So it's not like it's a set thing, but, um, we try to try to move as much as we can with keeping the people and the livestock happy. And, um, yeah, so in the summertime, we're kind of on the same deal. I, I like the, the term adaptive grazing. Sometimes we're all, I'll change every pasture gets grazed different every year. Sometimes I'll go up to a million pounds an acre if I have time and we'll, really focus on some areas and change those areas every year and then sometimes a lot we're down to forty thousand pounds an acre so um a lot a lot of our country like you say right now we're trying to just flash over because of last year's drought we were everything's kind of behind and we're sitting around twenty thousand pounds an acre so we're not super intense but compared to all of the people around us that are, you know, maybe 300 pounds to an acre, it's definitely much more intense. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And uh, you were kind of answering the question there um, with the adaptive grace, which I really like. And I think a lot of that, you know, makes a ton of sense to me um, that because at the beginning you had said, you know, you guys are enjoying this lifestyle and having more time and all that. But then you were talking about daily moves and that seemed like a lot of work to go and move cows, you know, every single day have to go and, and do all that. Um, but explain a little bit more on like, you know, how are you determining then like how to be adaptive? Like how do you, how do you visually, you know, determine like when it's the right time to move them? Because it sounds like it's just, it's not that there's a set schedule that every morning at, you know, seven thirty in the morning you move cows. Like it's not quite like that. What, you know, what's that process actually look like, I guess, to determine how to actually move them and how to actually like figure out, okay, 
it's the right time to move or no, let's let's wait another couple hours or, or another day. Right. So like you say, it's kind of a it's a, a hard one to just give somebody the recipe to go and do. And like you say, over the past, I we've been doing it for 10 years now, and I definitely don't have it figured out to the exact science. But that's what I think why it is a little hard challenging and hard for people to try because there isn't a recipe that you can just go get from your local feed store to go move your cows and know exactly when to do it you know it's it's constantly changing with what stage our grasses are in what the ground you know if I took a little bit too much last year or the year before if we were off by a couple hours and they ended up grazing more than I would have liked and so we have a little bit more ground showing then I'd like this year, I will change, you know, I'll visually you just have to look at it and then kind of make base your decisions off of it. You know, a lot of visual, visual observation to, uh, to base your decisions on. So like we, we mix the MIG, the mob, and I don't know if rotation is the correct word, but we kind of, that's what I think adaptive mixes all those together and puts them into one. And so the, like for us, we can move our 500 yearlings in about 15 minutes. We have, we have put in quite a bit of permanent infrastructure and water lines and fences in the last 10 years, but um, we move them on like a strip grazing system. So then all we have to do is move a quarter mile reel and then they can back graze to the water. And that that's made life a lot easier. And um, we, like you say, the it's 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 a hard it's it's a hard thing to just say. Well, we give them this much time, like you say, twelve hours, and it's it's something that you learn as you do it. I mean, there's there's a lot smarter guys than me that can give you better better recipes for getting set up to do it. But it's a lot of just visual observation, and that's why I'm I'm sorry if I'm not answering your question as far as the the exact name for it. No, that's great. I think. I think the main thing just being that, you know, I think a lot of, a lot of farmers or a lot of, a lot of cattle guys will hear about, you know, moving cattle daily or some, you know, some guys obviously move them even, you know, a couple times a day. And it just seems like a heck of a lot of work, but to your point that you're explaining here now, well, it's move them to the right size paddock based on how much you want to graze down, how much of that forage you want to actually take off. And if you want to move them, you know, at least like it's it's great to move them more rapidly to reduce compaction and to be able to really mimic the natural system you know just like the buffalo that's the whole the whole concept here exactly yep but um but if you want to go and you're going to be out of town for the weekend or something like that then just set up the paddock to be a little bit bigger to give them enough forage until you get back home and and that's fine you know you'll have to like make sure that you plan it out to have it in the right spot that it's not you know, maybe it's not in the low area that if you do get a rain, they're going to really tear stuff up because it's, you know, low or heavy soils or something like that. But uh, that just makes a ton of sense on not being super like just romantic about, oh, I got to move them exactly every 24 hours. It just makes it so much better. I really like that adaptive grazing. Just that that concept just makes a ton of sense. Yeah, it, it just it's it's a lot. I think it's not setting people up for failure because I know when we first started to we were thought we were rotational grazing. We had an equip program back in like 06 and it was set up for an eight pasture rotation. And I know the first three years that I did that, I was rotationally over grazing because I was had too small of a group of cows and the pastures were too large. So then I thought I was really doing something, you know, I was like, man, we're moving cows back then and that was before I even knew who Gabe Brown was but our neighbors had kind of done some moving and so I was like well man I'm really doing it and so I was in the wrong because we were basically would have been just as you know we moved through those eight pastures and I was moving through them too fast and with too small a group of cattle and so I I thought I was doing something right but I was actually probably just as damaging to the ecosystem as if I would have been continuously grazing it you know because they just kept coming back to those same spots that they were at previously instead of going out and evenly grazing the pasture but that was just something i had no idea what what i was doing like you say and um 
it it just we're that's the whole thing we're trying to mimic the bison like you say back in the day that that's kind of what our goal is is to mimic that as closely as we can so we'll be right back after this short break So one thing that you did mention earlier was um, you were using some numbers, like some math, uh, I think you said million pounds per acre. Can you share what you meant by that? Just give like a little more explanation for anyone that's not familiar with ranching and doesn't know what that means. Yeah, so um, let's, I'm, I'll am i try to use some math that isn't going to require me to use a calculator, but <laughs> okay. I'm not, gar- not guaranteeing anything. But um, in the U.S., I think it's like 350 pounds per of animal is on an acre of land, you know, in a given pasture. So when you think about that, that's like a cow is given four four acres, you know, roughly give or take it, per cow is what they're, how big a pasture they have. So I'm taking that down to, let's say we have thousand pound yearlings and I have 500 of them. So I'm going to give them an I could be wrong on saying this, but 500 of them, that'd be 500,000 pounds. I will put them on a half an acre and that will put me at a million pounds an acre. So if I'm really trying to, you know, they're not eating hardly, but maybe five to 1% of what they're actually getting, you know, most of it's getting trampled. I'll do that in areas with like weed problems, um, you know, can thistle and stuff like that. So they're not selective and they're just really trampling that down, getting that ground covered up really well. And we don't do that a lot. Like you say, I just do that in those areas that are, I'm trying to focus on, but that's where your labor is really intense. But we'll do that with um, our bat latches. We, those, they're uh, solar powered, automatic gate opener and so then the cattle can move themselves into a new area and i don't have to be there and i can set them up um we i built a deal like neil dennis had for our side by side to set up fence so it takes me roughly 15 15 to 16 minutes to tear down and put up a quarter mile reel so i mean i can set our fences up you know mid-afternoon mid-morning and it doesn't take up a lot of my day because i'm just like you were saying, I used to be one of those skeptical ranchers and was like, I don't have time to move my cows. Why would I do that? You know, seems like a waste of time. It's really not that invasive as far as time. And <laughs> you get to see your cattle more. And it's just they're they're healthier because they're getting new forage daily, you know, instead of going out and grazing through the same pasture. Their, their gains are better. They're healthier. It just, it's a... As an ecosystem as a whole, it works out a heck of a lot better for us. Are you now seeing a lot of like your other neighbors and stuff that are starting to pick up, you know, more of that also like more intensive, you know, mob grazing or the the adaptive grazing stuff or are most other of your neighbors still just doing it the old way of just turn them out on the pasture and, you know, not look at them for weeks? Yeah, I have a, I have a friend of mine that they were farther along in the fencing than us but they kind of started grazing the same way we did at the same time, but they were doing the electric fencing and kind of getting set up for it since the eighties, but they still were kind of the rotational overgrazing almost. I mean, they were, they were doing it better than we were for sure, but they weren't uh, the stature they are now. And it's been kind of fun because we've been able to communicate with each other and, you know, Hey, what are you doing here? What's going on there? And that's been fun to have that because I know there's a lot of people on this regenerative road that you don't have that. It's a whole different change and it's hard to admit that maybe what I've been doing is wrong. So um, there's not very many of our neighbors. I mean, they, they ask about it and they'll try some certain things such as like bale grazing, you know, might go try that, but there's not very many people that are bought into it yet, but I, it is growing. I mean, there's a lot more younger couples around us that are very inquisitive and they've come out and come to the place and seen what we're doing, you know, and are interested in it. And I think they're kind of on those baby steps of starting it and trying it themselves. So that's fun to see. But as far as a few of my older neighbors, they're not, they definitely haven't changed yet. Well, it's just going to be a big journey of, you know, more people kind of hopping on the regen bandwagon and 
And uh, like, you know, more and more people will catch on over time. And to your point, there's a lot of people that are starting to get it figured out, whether it be adopting regenerative systems for, you know, for a livestock situation and a ranch like what you guys have or row crop, you know, like, like I'm used to, but you know, and that's where with the podcast and all this stuff, it's just trying to continue to really tell those stories and, and make sure that more, more and more people become aware. And I mean, Tara, you see on the sustainability side of like, you know, people becoming more interested in how their food's grown, where it comes from, all, all that stuff. So I have a question for you, kind of like carrying this on to the next phase. So one thing that you do do, talking about like consumers and people being more interested in their food, you mentioned that you do direct to consumer hog sales. Um, I think is I think you just said just hogs. What does that look like, and what made you decide to take that route? You said obviously the you know meat and potatoes of your operation is still cow calves, but like why why did you add that addition? Do you see yourself growing more there with maybe even beef, or what are you thinking? The direct marketing deal, my wife has kind of taken over that business. She's a really good people person, and she probably should be the one talking to you guys. But um, she's the one that's kind of taken over the meat business, and she does beef and the pigs, I guess. We don't have a bird processing plant, so we haven't got into that yet. But we do beef and pigs. And so the pork deal was just uh, I got into them on a fluke deal and um, just – Ended up with a few sows and started ferreting them out in straw bales and kind of just, you know, I was the one that actually got Paul and Gabe into, I didn't get them into it, but I helped them get their foot in the door on the pastured pork because I'd been raising pigs a few years before they did. And uh, that that was a fun, fun to see how their pig operations changed in the last 10 years. But they, uh, the pig deal, it was kind of started out just to, go local, sell meat local to people because there's only one other guy in town selling pigs. And so we started with that and I kind of ran it. And now my wife's taking that over and she sells sticks. She sells, you know, custom cuts, holes, halves and quarters and stuff. And uh, we do the same with the pork, but she'll go around and do meat drop offs every two weeks. And we're by no means like these big guys that are um, like, Paul and Gabe and whatnot, but um, we're we're just kind of looking for another source of income for us on the place and to you know market some market some beef off of the ranch that wasn't just going through you know through a sale barn or going going to a local cattle buyer type of a deal was how that got started. So on that note too, when you um, market your cattle, they they just are do you market them as anything special or, you know, and then obviously your hogs and your direct to consumer beef are, is part of your marketing plan, like strategy sharing about the regenerative side of things? Yes. Yes. There it, it, it is. And so we'll, we have a base from Bismarck to Billings, even farther. We'll, we have shipped all over the U S but um, there it's, Right locally, you don't see a whole lot of people that care about exactly what their animal was fed, you know, what was in them. But the further you get out, the, and like you say, my wife's done a much better job marketing than I ever did. But she's she's very she's doing a very good job, you know, kind of informing our customers that of, you know, what our animals are fed, how they're treated. And then, you know, as far as just the direct marketing side and then as far as all of our steers and our excess heifers and whatnot, then instead of just going to the sale barn with them, we sell them to country natural beef. They're uh, all natural calf buyer. And so that gives us a premium on our calves, which is way, but you know, that helps with the lighter calves, but they'll go somewhere, get finished on the grass and, end up in stores like Whole Foods and whatnot. So we do, we, you know, we keep track of anything that we do give an antibiotic to and they don't go through our direct meat marketing or to Country Natural Beef. You know, we keep track of all that. But um, that's been something that's been big for us to know that, you know, we can sell a couple loads of calves right off the place and not go to the local sale barn and not know what you're going to get. And then instead of being able to have them leave the place, weigh them on the place, and you you have a lot more control over what's going on. 
how does it work out with uh, like availability of getting the actual animals processed and stuff like that? I know with in my neck of the woods, like especially during COVID stuff, a lot of those local lockers were way backed up. Are you guys having that same type of problem up there in Montana? Um, yes, it's gotten a lot better in the last six months. Um, like you say, my wife had a she had her. I don't know if it was just you know coincidence or what, but she had a lot of dates already locked in before COVID hit. Otherwise we might have been up yeah, we might have been SOL. But we we were able to keep all of our stuff getting processed during through all through all that. And then now there's been a lot more USDA plants opened up in the last six months in our area, especially we used to have one and now there's six or seven. So there's a lot more availability as far as that goes. But um, the few guys that we were going to, we've stayed loyal to them. And I think they appreciate that. So we can, she can kind of get in whenever we need to. So that's been nice. So not to totally shift gears, but one thing we haven't even talked about is that you have a greenhouse. Um, oh. What is, what What is the greenhouse? Is that just for personal use? Like what, are, what all are you growing in there? Nothing bad. <laughs> no, we're, uh, we, uh, it started out just for personal use. Um, we do sell a little bit locally, you know, we'll sell some le- lettuce and radishes and tomatoes and few, few other things just locally. But, um, most of it is all just for us. And then, you know, trying to just kind of follow this whole regenerative living deal. I mean, we are what we eat. So we're trying to raise instead of going and buying it, excuse me, at the grocery store, you know, just raising stuff that we know what it's, how it's been raised, what's been put into it. And um, just for our girls, our, I have two daughters, one's five, one's two. They love to go play in the dirt and work in the greenhouse with me and Abby. And we we really enjoy that. It's kind of a sanctuary. Last year, even with our drought, it, we were our greenest part of the years is in May and June, and we were brown in May. So it was kind of nice to be able to sneak away and get into the greenhouse and feel some warm, moist air instead of just hot, dry air. And uh, it, it was kind of a, an oasis for us, as you will. When did you guys uh, get the greenhouse, or when did you get into that type of stuff? Um, it was one, I guess I built it in, I think, the spring of twenty. Uh, spring of 19 sorry it would have been the spring of 19 we was our 19 was our first year having it and um yeah it's been it's been enjoyable to have it just to you know lengthen our growing season for some of our stuff and get plants started earlier and as far as for our garden it's it's not a big greenhouse by any means and but it is big enough to keep us filled up with food and be able to sell a little bit locally. Um, I don't know about you. I have a super small, super, super small garden, just grow a few things, but it is much easier to get kids to eat their vegetables when they grew them themselves. <laughs> exactly. Yes, it is. Uh, that's kind of what we found. We have a very picky, one of our daughters is very picky. And if she grew it and knew she grew it, she will try it. And so that's been fun to see that. I need to go work on my garden when I get home. I got everything planted, but I've got uh, I've got cover crop on my garden and of course, and, uh, but I've, it's still up there growing and, uh, it's all of course pollinated and stuff. Now it's just a bunch of Elbon cereal rye. And, uh, so I need to go get that worked on here once I get back home, make sure that all my plants are doing okay. But, um, but that's been kind of a fun deal too, you know, just in mine too, just a tiny little, little garden, but just dorking around putting some cover crop out on that too that's awesome so do you uh just roll the rye down and plan into that then or what do you do there i planted right into it now i'm just kind of mashing it down as i go and i'll i'll uh see about even potentially just kind of harvesting some over the top i've got just a little bit and uh so i'm just i've got enough that i can just kind of stomp it down with my feet even awesome uh or just you know just just kind of knock it down that way or weed eat it or uh, we'll see we'll see how it goes but but you've got other you were talking about other cover crop type stuff too on that because you guys do still have some crop ground right or you're using about some other cover crops tell us about some of that stuff well um we we tried the winter triticale which is basically rye like you say um winter triticale and willow creek 
because our winter crops seem to do much better where we're at than spring crops. You get a little bit of fall moisture and it just has a lot better chance of producing some tonnage and being productive for the next year. So we tried that and planted that with like hairy vetch and winter peas. We never had much luck getting the winter peas to make it through the winter, but they did fix a lot of nitrogen for those crops during the fall. And so we were playing around with that and we'd graze a lot of that down you know, and put as much of it back into some of our areas that we really needed to focus on soil health as we could. And that was really fun to see. We went from areas of infiltration rate on our place that was about an inch an hour is all that our soil would take to, we had uh, Ray Archuleta out in 2019 and we did a bunch of infiltration tests and we had land that would take 20 inches of rain an hour. And so that and that was just after grazing, you know, triticale down and built, getting that mat covered up and that soil just, I mean, just jump started with the triticale and hairy vetch. And to go from an inch an hour to 20 inches an hour was pretty mind boggling for me. I was just like, I'd heard of Gabe, you know, being able to do that. And I was like, well, maybe in 25 years I'll be there. But it was it was fun to see how fast that triticale and vetch and grazing it correctly and knocking a bunch of it down jump started that process. Yeah, that's so cool. That's exactly what we're seeing on ours. Um, I haven't used any triticale, but in my peas this year also were not good. <laughs> it didn't really work at all. We tried some uh uh, I guess it was some sweet clover that we tried here here this year that didn't work. Harry Vetch has worked really well, but you're not necessarily using cereal rye up there. You're doing the uh, the triticale, which is very similar, you know, the hybrid, but uh, right, but not necessarily using cereal rye. And it's kind of I'm just surprised that you that you guys aren't. Yeah, we we did kind of switch to the rye just because it cost a seed of that triticale as times went on. But we bought some triticale from Gabe and. We just, you know, kept enough that we would combine ourselves and then kept using that seed. And because it's just kind of how we raise our cattle, that seed's been grown in our environment. So it's going to do better than if we go and get something that was raised in Texas or New York or, you know. So we tried to keep that seed around for for that purpose. And it just happened to be that triticale was what we ended up using if we have used rye and had just as good a luck. It's it just kind of depends on what the seed costs are. Tara, that's what you guys have been doing triticale too, right? Yeah, we do some triticale. We call it triticale. <laughs> yep. Sorry, I, I know there's. I don't know the correct. <laughs> as soon words, as you said it, I was like, it. oh my gosh, am I been saying it wrong this whole time? Um, we need to have a debate on that at some point because yeah, I uh, sometimes call it triticale, sometimes triticale. We need to we need to get that figured out. I think that might have to be something we got to solve on the on the podcast <laughs> here and get that figured out because I think I don't know if anybody knows what it's actually called. Well, that's what I was about to say. Out of all the people we've interviewed, everyone says it different. Like, who's saying it right? Like, how does no one know the right way to say triticale or triticale? I think that's a tomato tomato <laughs> deal. I think we could just we can have both. I, I've called it both, but like you say, I I don't know what the correct way is. So <laughs> so Mitchell keeps asking you questions about crops. Um, I'm gonna take us back to cattle. I have one question, and this kind of goes back to the very beginning of the conversation. So I'm sorry, but I didn't get a chance to ask it. You changed your calving season from like February to May, and you mentioned it was like ecosystem. But can you share a little bit more about why you made that change? It's just my dad and I on the place as far as labor. And we weren't set up with barns for calving in February. I mean, we're, I don't think we're Minnesota cold, but we, it's nothing for us to have four, four to five weeks at 20 below in February and March. And so when you're doing that with baby calves and dragging them into a barn and getting up every two hours at night, it's, it's exhausting. And which I'm sure there's a lot of people that can attest to that. And we just went through two horrendous storms in our area. As far as April storms, it ended up killing over 2000 calves in our County alone. And they were, they're bad storms They're 40 mile an hour wind for four days. And we got over three feet of snow and it was, it was a bad deal. And, um, it killed a lot of calves. And so I had lived through one of those in, I think, 08 or 09, we had had an April storm like that. And I didn't enjoy it at all. And I don't know anybody that did, but 
you know, the definition of insanity is trying the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result, I believe. And farmers and ranchers are, I believe, very good at doing that. And I'm one of them, so I can say that. But I'm sure I'll get a lot of hate for that. But we we were, I think in 18, we had like three feet of snow on the level in our corrals. We had to move a bunch of snow before we could calve. And then we hauled in all this high dollar feed and straw in there to bed them. And we, I dragged calves to the barn and drag them, you know, and then put them out. And it was just like, why, why are we doing this? You know, I have to haul all the manure out instead of we can let them calve on grass and they can haul the manure out for us. We, and it was kind of a, our neighbor had gone to May calving before us and I thought he was nuts. I was like, what's he doing? You know, he's going to have little bitty calves. I, I don't want to do that. Anyways, it was kind of uh, that that year I did the numbers and figured it out because um, I'm a big numbers guy as far as lay it out on an Excel spreadsheet for me. And that's the, the truth. And so I did the numbers of how much feed we stuck into our cows there in February and March versus what we would have had to if we'd have been calving in May. And that was a, a big one for me. I was like, we can really easily raise a less or a lot lighter calf and be way more profitable than what we're doing right now and be much more, much happier than getting up every two hours in the night and dragging calves through the mud into the barn. And so that was the big push for us to go from February to May. And I mean, we're just about done calving. We we only breed for 35 days. That's kind of our culling process. I don't do hardly any culling with the cows. I just let the bulls cull them. So we, pull, we only have our bulls in for 35 days. I learned that one from Gabe. I don't know if he's still doing that or not, but that's kind of got our cows to where they are now. I mean, they're they're a lot they're a lot easier flushing lower input cattle than what we used to have and that that's just made our life so much easier to not not be messing with baby calves in february and march and then having calves get sick from april april and rain and snowstorms and just having them born on that green grass it's just it's just enjoyable to go out there and see a baby grass stepping up in a foot you know foot tall grass it's just healthy for me and healthy for them so we've uh we've really enjoyed that um it uh it definitely made all of our lives more enjoyable i loved that one of the first things you said was it's better for people and better for our animals that was like one of the comments um that you said at the very beginning and i think that's been a theme throughout this conversation that things that you've made changes on were not only better for your animals your planet like your soil health the ecosystem but also for you and like your mental health and what worked for you and and uh, you know the adaptive grazing everything has been um you know a very holistic approach to farming, ranching, um, agriculture. And, um, I just commend you on that for taking into account like your family time, your, your mental health and, and having that actually be a factor in making management decisions as well. Thank you. Yeah. It's, it's definitely been a big one for us and it's, it's gotten to be a bigger thing for us since I've had two little girls because before then my wife would put up with me and go with me everywhere. But once you have two little girls, you want to go hang out with them in the yard and play with them. So that's been, uh, like you say, that's why, that's why I'm doing this is for the next generation. So I, that's my big goal is to leave the place better than I got it. And I, I really want to do that for my kids, whether or not they want to farm and ranch for somebody's kids, but that's the, the big goal for us. Well, Tara, yeah, it's been uh, really good. Always fun to talk about, you know, ranching when we're hanging out on the podcast, too. We can't just talk about corn all the time. <laughs> yeah, Ryan, thanks for coming on and uh, changing it up for us. Well, thanks for having me. I sure enjoyed it. Well, Tara, this is a, a big moment. We're taking our first live listener question. We love hearing, you know, hearing everyone call in on our voicemail. Uh, but we got Jordan here with us and having him directly in to answer the question. Like, this is a big deal. This is a big deal, Tara. So uh, I guess we just get started. Yeah, like without further ado, like Jordan, what's your question? <laughs> <laughs> no, Jordan, tell us who you are, where you're from, then what's your question? 
Well, I'm originally from Bradenton, Florida. Um, I came to Georgia to go to college uh, about five years ago. I graduated with an ag degree, and then I moved back to Florida, started with an electrical co-op as a lineman apprentice, found out I didn't like that. So I wanted to come back up here, and my previous employer gave me an opportunity to uh, lease some farmland on my own. So I'm actually a first-generation farmer. This is my first year on my own, and uh, we're growing peanuts and cotton. And uh, right now, my I guess my main question is, we're strip-tilling cotton into cover, uh, like y'all talk about with the regenerative ag and strip tillage and reduced tillage. But uh, with our peanuts, it's primarily conventional tillage. I mean, we're doing uh, we're turning dirt with a turn plow, and then um, for harvest, it's a pretty a vigorous process of digging. So I don't see how a reduced tillage practice would be good with peanuts or how it would even be possible. So it was just a, it was a curious, a curiosity I had. And uh, cause I would love to get into, you know, reduced tillage because of all the benefits that, you know, y'all talk about every day. So. Yeah, no, that's a super interesting question. And I, you know, I don't know that I have a, a great answer, but First, first though, is a follow-up question on like, what's the row spacing on your peanuts? I'm assuming the cotton's on 30 or 38 inch spacing, but what's the, what are the peanut row spacings? Yeah, so our cotton is uh, is 38. Uh, peanuts are the same, but they're uh, twin row. So to me, I, I still think that the vertical till kind of, or that the uh, strip till could work on the peanuts. Now, obviously when you're harvesting, you're going to basically go through and till the whole thing. So that's going to be a tillage pass that we're not going to be able to really fully get away from. But my thought on this, and I'm starting to work on some peanuts uh, over in North Carolina. And basically with that, it's, you know, can we take off the cotton, you know, put on our diverse cover crop cocktail at that point, strip till into that, into that cover crop, just like you're doing right now ahead of, ahead of cotton. But you know, move that strip over a little bit to not be putting right on top of those cotton, um, you know, the right. stalks that are still out there. But, but to be able to, you know, to kind of strip till off to the side and be able to put the peanuts into that strip. Um, okay. And with your twin row, of course, it'll be, you know, a little bit off, like the spacing and stuff is going to be kind of weird. So you might have to figure out how to adjust your strip till setup. Cause I'm assuming the peanuts between the two rows or between the two twins it'd be what like maybe four or six inches and how like how wide is your do you, like do you think that would work if you had a strip and then you had be able to still get those twin rows of peanuts like down into that strip do you think there'd be enough space there or the strip till is not quite wide enough yeah i i believe you know we could do we could plant strip but my my question was digging them i don't know if you've ever seen the process of getting peanuts ready Basically, you're you're running a blade underground, cutting the roots off, and then inverting them and letting them dry. So with all that cover, I don't see the inverter being effective because even if you have some pigweed in the ground, it just it it really makes it hard. But the cover crop, by the time you're ready to go and dig, that cover crop is going to be dead and right. and kill you know and and all decompose. So I suppose you just have the cover get it killed off plenty early when you've got you know plant, plant your peanuts green and then get it killed. And over time, once you get your biological activity really built up, you'll be able to decompose all that cover and have have a pretty bare field, you know, that's just the peanuts when you come to dig them. Right. Uh, and basically, yeah, to still do the digger. We're not going to be able to get away from that anytime soon. But but to go through, flip over those peanuts, you know, then get them harvested and then get the cover back out there as soon as we can after. It's at least reducing the overall tillage. I mean, to me, Regen Ag is about, implementing those principles to the extent that the context really allows us to. And if you're just doing a simple, you know, strip till pass ahead of the cotton, a strip till pass ahead of the, the peanuts, and then the only real tillage that's happening is when you're harvesting those peanuts, I think that's a great move towards just reducing. Yeah, you're going to not be able to get as far, you know, as maybe uh, somebody else could that if you didn't have that you know, uh, harvest pass going on. But um, if you can get that cover crop cocktail out there, get that field put back together, I think there's a good opportunity to, to still right. build up soil health. Last kind of uh, thought that I've got too would be, you know, could we get a third crop into the rotation? Maybe have, you know, uh, like a corn, 
cotton and then peanuts or something like that, or a wheat or something like that in there, that then you've got an extra year of reduced till and of Bevers cover crops to really get that soil built up um, and then spread out that really invasive disturbance to fewer occurrences of disturbance within a longer term crop rotation. Yeah, I can see where the third uh, crop rotation would help break down those cotton stalks too. That's another issue we have is those cotton stalks, you know, it's a perennial plant, so they, they last uh, quite, a, quite a while as far as residue. So, but, well, awesome. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, man, makes a ton of sense. Tara, what do you think? <laughs> I feel like you guys are speaking a different language. <laughs> Farming. No, nah, it's an interesting question. I've been thinking about it a lot, though, on uh, for peanuts, for potatoes, for sweet potatoes, onions, carrots. Like, how do you how do you go and do that? I, my thought is, you know, just try to spread out that crop rotation, minimize the disturbance. We're never going to be able to get to 100% right. zero disturbance right. in a crop like that. Um, but at least be able to minimize it really hammer on building up the soil health when you have the opportunity to and i think you're at least still moving in the right direction um so interesting uh really really interesting deal and we'll have to keep in touch if uh, if we hear of anybody that is having luck with yeah, really reducing sure. tillage on their peanuts um if if anyone knows anything definitely give us a call uh or hit up jordan uh if anyone has any ideas on how to continue to Implement regenerative yep. systems in a peanut for sure. Peanut operation. Thank you, Jordan. Great question. Oh yeah, thank y'all for having me. Thanks everyone for listening in here today, and thanks to Todd Melby who produces our show, um, and thanks to Anna Canny who gives us a lot of great help. Thank you to Christian Schmidt, who runs our social media, and Lauren Humpert, who is our project coordinator. Thanks to all the technical directors at American Public Media who help us record and mix the show, especially the talented Alex Simpson. Be sure to check us out on social media. We're at Fieldwork Talk on all the usual channels, and we'd love it if you wrote us a review to help other people find us too. And make sure to call us, because now you might be able to come and ask your question live on the show. So that's fun. Give us a call, 651-228-4810. 651-228-4810. Thank you for listening, and we'll catch you next week.